Once again, um, I am back with another blue review. Um, I have a few other episodes sketched out that I'm really kind of passionate about doing a good job on, and I need to kind of tweak some of my notes and facts a little bit. Um, some of my sketched out a few weeks ago. Uh, one was actually uh, election appropriate. <clears throat> Uh, and I let that time pass, but I'm still going to review the uh, film. I've got uh, some streaming reviews, and I have some extremely forgotten segments. Uh, and then uh, I should have a special uh, brand new release uh, coming to me by next Wednesday. I will do an exhaustive unboxing. Very excited, major, major release. I had to pay it in installments over four months to pay for it. I just paid it off. Don't, I'm not gonna be able to do anything on like that again. November this month is the Criterion Barnes and Noble 50% off sale. I was so hoping I'd have some kind of windfall by now and be able to buy the Wong Kar Y box set for half off. It's just not gonna happen, so. Anyway, if anyone wants to buy any of these for half off from me for uh, channel patronage, I'd be down and I'd be forever grateful. And you, of course, would get full credit and all kinds of other perks. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, I'm trying to knock out and align as many videos as I can between now and um, the day after Thanksgiving. Uh, which I guess is going to be Friday the 25th. Uh, I am off work <laughs> early that evening, and I'm off work on Saturday the 26th. So I've made a list of uh, videos I want to get done by the 26th, and then a few more I want to get done by the end of the month. And then what I can't, I've shunted over to December. Uh, some essential ones that really have to get done by the end of the year. So that I can kind of go forward with a clean slate for 2024, uh, in which I'm going to try to really expand this whole operation, if possible. <clears throat> and your support is uh, welcome, desperately needed, and much appreciated. Um, so I've decided that um, I'm gonna just review a movie that I've always loved, that I've had a special edition of on Blu-ray for a while. I have never reviewed it on here. I may have mentioned it in passing in other reviews. And I think it's time just to do a proper review and I, I'm intimately familiar enough with the film that I believe that I could just, just uh, do it. So, Let's do it. Came out uh, three or four years ago on a label called, well, it's done by Film Movement Blu ray release. This is The Great Silence. <clears throat> this is the 50th anniversary restoration. It's a beautiful restoration. Beautifully shot film. Jean Louis Trintignant. Klaus Kinski, Benetta McGee, Frank Wolf, amazing cast. Incredible artwork. And it says from the director of Django, one of the finest westerns ever. I cannot argue with that. This one is probably, probably still in my top 25 favorite films of all time, just as Django has remained in my top 10. Uh, Corbucci is a rare director like George Romero, who uh, I hold that many <laughs> of their films in, in high regard and within my top, you know, 25, 30 films. Let me read you a, bit, a little bit about this film on the back. 
Corpucci's West was the most violent, surreal, and pitiless landscape of any director in the history of the genre. Credited to Quentin Tarantino, he's rarely that eloquent. On an unforgiving, he didn't write this part, this is the, the blurb. On an unforgiving snow-swept frontier, a group of bloodthirsty bounty hunters, led by the vicious loco, Klaus Kinski, prey on a band of persecuted outlaws who have taken to the hills. Only a mute gunslinger named Silence, Jean-Louis Trintignant, stands between the innocent refugees and the corrupt killers. So in this harsh, brutal world, the lines between right and wrong are not always clear, and good does not always triumph, featuring superb photography and a haunting score from Maestro Ennio Marconi, director Sergio Corbucci's bleak, Brilliant and violent vision of an immoral, honorless West is widely considered to be among the best and most influential Westerns ever made. Not just spaghetti Western. And I 100% agree with that. You know, this was one of the ones that floated around in the 90s as a bootleg. I think Luminous Film and Video Works, which is kind of a gray market company like Video Search, that they uh, provided much better prints on um, VHS. Uh, that's where I first read about it and gained interest in it. Um, I don't believe I ever acquired a, um, I don't think I ever acquired a VHS, uh, copy of The Great Silence. The first time I saw it, I believe I had borrowed a copy from a friend, either Scott Mosley or Michael Jones. It was always them or Marksman. We were all trading amongst ourselves, enriching our knowledge in the, in the, towards the end of the 90s, early 2000s. It was a time of discovery. Um, and this is really one of the ones that for people who are like all the people I just mentioned, including myself, big fans of Euro trash or European trash cinema or you know, <clears throat> Euro Westerns, European horror, what have you, you know, Italian, Spanish, German, you know, we were getting into all that stuff, uh, French, we were exploring all those angles, you know, everything, you know, from Corbucci down to Jean Roland and Maria Bava and all the way across uh, the spectrum. And, uh, that's still a big part of my viewing and my um, passion. So <clears throat> I'm going to open this up so we can talk a little bit more about the Blu-ray and then I'm going to talk a bit about the movie. Some other blurbs on here. One says raw, nasty, and blood-soaked, says the New York Times. One of the most stylish and powerful spaghetti westerns, says Eric Monder, Film Journal International. Here are the bonus features. Cox or Corbucci, Alex Cox based tribute to the maestro. Western Italian style, 1968 documentary. Two alternate endings, original Italian and English language versions with subtitles. Ending the Silence, a new essay by film critic Simon Abrams and the original theatrical trailer. Uh, this was uh, the main Print of this is Italian with English subtitles, 105 minutes, 1.85 one widescreen, a new 2K digital restoration, new as of a few years ago, a 1968 film, and an Italian French co production. So let's look inside this guy. Here's the great silence. I really love this monochromatic art, little tinges of. Uh, kind of purpley and, and lavender. -y. This is not the pu mo most well-known poster or even one. So we take this uh, disc out and we have really this bleak snow-drenched landscape and a few scattered riders. So this was historically as far as I've been able to discern my, you know, fair amount of research, the first snowbound Western, uh, it precedes 
McCabe and Mrs. Miller, and of course, then there were a bunch after that, bit by bit, um, all the way years down later down to Tarantino's Hateful Eight, um, which you know I, I believe it was inspired by that. <clears throat> Though I think Hateful Eight Snowbound uh, setting was also <laughs> inspired by Carpenter's The Thing. Um, but in any case, in Moore County's music was used for for Hateful Eight. Um, and look at this booklet here. Amazing graphics. So Silence, as rendered by Zhongli Trinity, is a formidable character. Visually resplendent, evocative of the hippies of the era. He uses this German Mauser gun. And he has a particular modus operandi. He shoots off the some or all of the fingers of his foes so they can never again fire a weapon. Um, he's pretty inscrutable being mute and all. Um, hence they call him Silence or the Great Silence. Uh, there's someone dragging one of the bounty, uh, bounty hunters dragging one of the people whose uh, bounty was sought after. Uh, let's look at this cast here. So Jean-Louis Trentignant plays Gordon. His first name is never given. Uh, as a child, he was known as Gordon. His father was named Gordon. Slash Silent. Voskinski is Tigrero slash Loco. Uh, different uh, translations, the English, the Italian, and others. Usually call him Loco, but sometimes he's called Tigrera. But you know the default that most fans uh, we've come up with is his full appellation would be Loco Tigrero. Possibly Lo Tigrero is is his name, but Loco is a nickname describing his his mania. Frank Wolf plays Sheriff Gideon Burnett. Luigi Pastilli, no no stranger to Italian genre film. Plays Henry Pollockett, a uh, very corrupt uh, landowner, politician kind of guy. Mario Braga plays Martin. Mario Braga's in all these movies. Vanetta McGee plays Pauline Middleton. And really, her, her name should have been at least after Klaus Kinski. Because to me, she's kind of the heart of this film. Story was by Sergio Corbucci. Screenplay was by Sergio with his brother Bruno Corbucci, who they collaborated quite a bit back then, along with Vittoriano Petrilli, Mario Amendola. Um, cinematography was by Silvano Ippoliti. Music by Ennio Marconi. Costume design, Enrico Job, and great job. Art direction, Ricardo Dominelli Nietzsche. Directed by Sergio Corbucci. Two-store restoration from the original negative, courtesy of Compass Film, SR, SRL. Uh, and th this incredible cover art was done by Midnight Marauder and Tony Stella. I don't know if Tony Stella did the actual rendering, and Midnight Marauder did the graphic design and lettering, or vice versa, or a little both. Uh, yes. So this is very interesting. Now, originally, A Great Silence on digital uh, disc came out via Fantoma, and it was a very popular and well-loved edition, uh, I, one that I watched to death, you know, <clears throat> but, but not to where it was, like, so fucked up I couldn't sell it, which I ended up doing. I can't remember how much I got. Maybe $20. I sold it a couple of years ago, um, especially when I heard this was coming out. Um... And uh, that was a very good addition. The Alex Cox feature is on there. Um, the trailer was on there. The language options. Uh, the essay was not in it. That's a new essay. Altered endings were on it. But the Western Italian style, I don't think was on it. The Western Italian style, this is a spaghetti Western documentary that's been cannibalized and uh, uh, pieces have been used on various Spaghetti Western Blu-rays as supplemental materials. 
So like they'll they'll cut out the part that's uh, appropriate to the particular film that they're going to add it to on Blu-ray. Um, and then I don't know. I did used to know, and I've forgotten uh, if you can get Western Tone Cell by itself on Blu-ray, or possibly one of these uh, Spaghetti Western Blu-ray releases may have the entire feature as a, as a feature. I mean, th this this could have the entire feature for all I know. My memory is kind of bad. I only watched it on here once. But like I said, I've seen segments of it on other Blu-rays. So let's look at uh, Simon Abrams, film critic, and his new essay. So like I said, there's some really wonderful graphics and credits here. His essay is called Ending the Silence. Again, you have some classic shots. There's Klaus and there's Luigi Castelli. There's Polycut. Polycut is a bureaucrat. He's a hypocrite. He's trying to profit off the, the bounty hunter uh, thing here. This is a beautiful, beautiful shot of the costume. Vanetta McGee as Pauline is just stunning. And of course, Klaus as Loco has rarely looked cooler. And the beautiful snow. Uh, here we go. I think these are people burying their dead. The people who were slaughtered by the bounty hunters and didn't get their bodies. I might be misrepresenting. So. And a bevy of, of well-known stills. I don't know how well you can see them. Uh, I forgot who this character was off the top of my head. There's um, Pauline in silence after they make love for the first time. And of course, her husband was one of the ones killed by the guy. Uh, Logo. And Loco. Uh, and I believe this is uh, Frank Wolf, the semi comic relief sheriff. And. Uh, Dragging the wagons through the snow. Absolutely iconic shot of Kinski as Loco. Uh, there's a few blurbs in here in his essay that are maybe worth uh, reading. One is The biggest difference between Shane and Silence is embedded in their main point of comparison. Neither man is ultimately welcomed back into society, albeit for very different reasons. So, uh, this film was, this is pretty much this, the plot. You know, Silence is trying to kill off the bounty hunters. The bounty hunters are trying to kill off the, the refugees in this town. Um, you know, the light, like I read here, the, the lines between... The moral lines are blurred, you know, completely uh, <clears throat> beyond recognizing. But there, there is a moral compass, and really, the moral compass is Pauline. You know, her husband's been killed by this this cycle uh, of, of bloodshed, and she's an honest woman, and she's a woman of color trying to survive, you know, on the frontier in these harsh weather. And just be fucking left alone, you know. Uh, she does see Silence as kind of a hero, but she's also very strong on her own. And after they make love, and of course he can't speak, she says, don't go out there, don't face them, Silence. I love you, Silence. I don't know, man, it's great. Um... It's they have a beautiful love scene, very sexy. I mean, not not over the top, but you know, very tender. Uh, you know, he takes his scarf off and reveals his throat was cut. That's why he can't speak. And you get into the flashbacks of the same kind of people like Loco that came to kill his father Gordon and uh, killed his parents and left him for dead with a slit throat. And of course, he's called silent because he's mute. But also, as Pauline points out, that she has heard uh, his legend that wherever he goes, the silence of the grave shall follow. So, the music Morricone writes is some of the most lyrical and beautiful 
uh, of any Italian soundtrack of this period. I, I adore it. Only a few come really close. Uh, Flavia the Heretics music by Nicola Piovani, who for years a lot of people insisted was a Morricone pseudonym. And I'm like, he's got 400 films under his own credit. How many does he have under Piovani? But they're two different people. Years later, Piovani won an Oscar for Screen Us soundtrack for Life is Beautiful. But he did an exceptionally beautiful lyrical job for a, a rather rough, harsh movie, Flavia, and, and drew, drew the beauty out in it. Uh, same could be said for Morricone here. The other Morricone soundtrack that kind of reminds me of Great Silence, that in the same vein as the soundtrack to Cat and Nine Tales by Argento, which I've reviewed on here and, and praised endlessly, even though it's like hated by everyone, including Argento. That's okay. Um, but it has that very mournful, uh, beautiful music. I wish I I had as much uh, formal mastery of the di uh, vocabulary of music theory as I do this the knowledge of it and the ways of, you know, the vibe, you know, the, the, the feeling of describing music. And, of course, I'm good on describing, like, the technical sides like extra instrument instrumentation instrumentation you know and 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 equipment and sounds and stuff in studios but i never was good on music theory per, per se i'm kind of a bite your guy so when you start getting into composers at the level of morricone it's difficult it's difficult to identify these motifs and signatures and, and name them by their proper names and and, and how they're using their craft to evoke these particular emotions and statements. So I'm doing my best here. may not be that great. Well, anyway, <sighs> bottom line is this is really, Tango is my favorite spaghetti western, my favorite western. Uh, this film is my second favorite spaghetti western, second favorite western. I think it's the best spaghetti western. I know better than Django. Django to me is iconic and will always resonate with me. It will always have that, I don't know, it, there's just something about it that uh, fills me with this kind of awe and um, wonder and this kind of uh, dramatic, this tragedy, this you know, uh, dramatic, you know, uh, existentialist, the cat dragging the coffin and his haunted past and, you know, and then he explodes literally with a Gatling gun on the fucking clan of all things, killing the racist, betting the Mexican woman and then his hands are shattered and he even comes back from that. Um, Django is an operatic uh, tour de force as a film. Uh, it, it's next level, high level for westerns. Um, people put Leone at the top of these, and and I get it, rightfully so. Once upon a time in the West is probably the finest spaghetti western ever made. But in my opinion, what what I resonate with specifically, and I love Once Upon a Time, and I, I will review it eventually. I have a very nice. Blu-ray edition. To me, Great Silence is the, the top of the top of the heap. Um, like I was going to say, it's a movie of firsts. It is a groundbreaking movie that was kind of largely ignored, and then other people uh, incorporated these tropes without really properly crediting it. Took credit for it, maybe not out of you know egotism or or any of that, just maybe not knowing, maybe out of ignorance, but so, these are there's three firsts in here. One, the first snowbound western, the first really snowbound western. There may have been echoes of it before that, but this is the deal. B before McCabe and Mrs. Miller, and then all the many that followed. The second big first is the very first um, truly interracial uh, romance slash love scene uh, in a western, 
of any Western. Now, this is preceding 100 Rifles, where the black Jim Brown beds the Hispanic Rocco Welch. That's a legitimate groundbreaker. Uh, but this is came this came a year or two before. Um, there are some movies which my friend Bill White pointed out to me that depict interracial uh, dalliances between a white man and, and an Indian woman. There's a bunch of those. Usually, the Indian women are played by white women. So, and there's no black people involved. So this is the very first one where you have an interracial situation. One partner is white and one is black. Uh, and it is a love story and a sexual uh, act and a doomed romance, a borning. Okay, so speaking of doomed, so then the third big, big uh, first for this one, no one gets out alive. None of the protagonists live. Frank Wolf, the silly sheriff, is gunned down. Everybody at the bar and saloon and wherever they all hang out, they're all killed. Um, you know, uh, yeah. Uh, Pauline and Silence are killed right around the same time. They kind of fall near each other or into each other's arms in the snow. And Loco and his his, his degenerates, uh, degenerate band of bounty hunters, they ride off, cheerfully. They also annihilate everybody in this bar that they have trapped at gunpoint. And of course, you know, silence is there ostensibly to save them now that the sheriff is dead. Um, and you know, uh, Pollock, who is kind of the the kind of degenerate, he's kind of like a preacher slash land grabber who's wanting to fuck uh, Pauline. Uh, you know, he gets nailed, and uh, <laughs> the slaughter in the in the bar is pretty wild. It's just like pure genocide, even though they're all mostly white people. Um, and, and silence comes maybe too late, and, and Pauline heroically tries to intercede, and she's shot down. Silence is shot too, and it's amazing, because you're like, this is not going to happen. This guy's shown he can blow off everybody's fucking fingers before they can move. And, uh... There's all kinds of possible subtext, you know, the, the, the grim, stolid, silent silence gives his heart to Pauline. And she also tries to find love again courageously after her husband's been killed by this purge. Um, to silence lose some of his power by being vulnerable. Does she lose some of hers? You know, they, they find love, but do they lose their edge? I mean, how can their love survive in a world where people, men like Loco are there to plunder the land and lives are nothing but currency for them to keep riding and rinse, repeat, you know, their whole, you know, psychotic way of existence. Food for thought. So it's a tragic, fucked up ending. So yeah, unhappy ending. All the heroes die. Heroes or protagonists die. So two big, three big uh, first. Now there are alternate endings, and of course the one that's most um, has been most seen as the one where silence, a la Clint Eastwood, and I believe if uh, for a few dollars more, has used some kind of metal shield or metal plate or something under his armor or with him to withstand some of these bullets. Um. And in this case, it's kind of really weird, like, you know, when he clutches his, himself uh, as he's shot, you know, in the alternate ending, uh, he reveals to Pauline that he, he saved her, and he reveals that he's got a this armored glove that took off the, you know, held the bullets like Wonder Woman's bracelets. 
Uh, and uh, I think he shoots Loco, or Loco gets away, I can't remember. But basically, he smiles, and I don't know, that's like the happy ending. And Alex Cox does such an incredible job talking about this movie. He is so attuned to this kind of shit. And um, tr a true scholar of spaghetti westerns, and he compares and contrasts the endings and the emotional heft. Um, the other alternate ending says there are two, but I, I have to watch it again. I don't remember the other one. I have a feeling it was very similar to either the commonly used one or the one I just described, and maybe not that different, but I could be wrong. So that's something you can discover when you buy this Blu-ray. I don't work for film movement, but this was an easy one to talk about. It's been with me for a long time. I truly love it. It's a very special movie. And uh, I've played it for people who aren't all that impressed by the kind of, you know, uh, nature of spaghetti westerns once they became popular and they were churned out to piecemeal which happened to all the Italian popular genres, Jallos, uh, Polizia Tesci's, you know, Sword and Sandal, Post-Apocalyptic, Cannibal, you know, all of them, there's the law of diminishing returns. So this is early enough in the cycle, and that means it's kind of a peak, you know, this is the same year as Once Upon a Time in the West. Uh, I have studied Spaghetti Westerns pretty extensively. I... Have I ever reviewed one for this channel? I'm wondering if this might not be my first one. I have seen almost 300 Spaghetti Westerns. Just right about 300. And really, by the parameters of what is considered the, the canon of Spaghetti Westerns, and I'm including co-productions and Spanish Spaghetti Westerns, too, um, there have been about 400 at least. Um... So I'm about three quarters of the way there, but I've been taking a long break. I, I, I completely immersed myself in them from 2016 to 2018. Uh, I went all over anywhere I could see them for free. I watched as many as humanly possible. I have a wonderful letterbox list you can check out. Maybe I'll put the link below. We can see uh, all the ones I've seen. I don't have them in order of date anymore. I don't have them in order of how I like them. That's the arduous task. Um, I have other friends who are aficionados who who also keep track of their spaghetti westerns. Uh, of course, one that comes to mind is uh, Sean Lee Levin, my buddy here, and there's also Neil Andrew Voice. Isn't it Andrew? Neil Voice. He he was a moderator of one of these uh, I shall not name cult movie groups, and he was the only one who treated me kindly uh, when I left, and so we're still friends. And he. He is truly a spaghetti western uh, expert and has seen, I believe, all 400 plus. Uh, I guess a guy, Darren Johnson, is one that comes to mind. I think we're still friends. I met him in that group too, and he's he's quite an expert in spaghetti western soundtracks. And there are a lot of incredible, incredible ones. So, anyway, thanks for listening. I wanted to be able to do a quick one and knock it out and keep Blue Review going. Take one more off the uh, bucket list to, to rap about. And uh, thank you for your reception to my Wakanda Forever video and my R.I.P. Nick Turner video so far. So good with those. I really need money. So if you want to buy these guys for $35 each or less, make me a deal. I've got tons of other stuff. And yes, I'm wearing my Ganja and Hess shirt. Bill Gunn, Dwayne Jones, Marlene Clark represent. So take care, my friends. We'll see you soon.